Working for you. A weekly talk radio program which highlights developments of national interest and the activities of your St. Kitts Davis government. Join host Les Roy Williams as he presents news, views, reports, and interviews about everything regarding the activities of the Team Unity government and the building of our communities and the development of St. Kitts Davis. Tune in and call in to interact with your government and share your views regarding the upward forward development of your community and our beautiful Twin Island Federation. Working for you is weekly, every Wednesday live from 1.30 p.m. to 3 p.m. on ZIZ Radio, with FM, and Sugar City FM with rebroadcast on participating stations. Working for you. Good afternoon, and I welcome you to another Working for You program. I am your host, Lesroy Williams. I am happy to be back after a restful vacation, and I want to say a big thank you to Jacqueline Bryan who filled in for me while I was away. Today we are going to be discussing drug prevention and treatment and I have here with me the director of the St. Kitts Nevis National Council for Drug Prevention Secretariat, Ms. Karimu Byron and I also have with me Drug Prevention Officer, Mr. Nourish Nital. Welcome to this program. Thank you so much, much for having us. Today, they are here to speak about the policies, function, action plan, and new initiatives of the St. Kiss Nevis National Council for Drug Prevention Secretariat. But before we can delve deeply into matters, I would like um, my guests to tell me something about themselves in terms of their background and experience. I want to start with the director. Thank you so <laughs> much Mr. Williams for having us here today on Working For You. We appreciate the opportunity to come and speak about the National Council on Drug Abuse Prevention Secretariat. Um, so as you said, my name is Karim Byron. I am the director of the Secretariat which is governed by the Council that consists of a number of representatives. My background is uh, psychology and behavioral health care. I have worked um, in the mental health field as well, and I have done research, a bit of research work for the Organization of American States. And uh, I think that's enough for <laughs> now so that <laughs> okay. we can get into what we are discussing here today. Well, I am Nourish Nital. I'm a chemist and a forensic psychologist. I've been working with inmates for the past seven to eight years and of course I'm a teacher for the over 30 years so everything just falls into proper perspective with respect to trying to execute the duties that are expected of me. Sure. Now good, thank you so much. I have with me of course as you heard very capable people to engage in the discussion that we will have this afternoon. Now Ms. Byron, can you tell me what is the relevance, the importance of having a National Council of Drug Prevention Secretariat, and when was it founded? Okay, the National Council on Drug Abuse Prevention was first constituted under the Drugs Act of 2000, and the office itself was established in July of 2001. I think it is very evident in our society of the dangers that substances alcohol, tobacco and other drugs have on the lives of individuals and not even only on the lives with regards to mental and physical health but it also impacts our productivity and of course a societal challenge we face with regards to substances especially when it is misused or abused and that is our primary focus at the National Council on Drug Abuse Prevention. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Now can you speak to a general overview of the Secretariat, including its function and policies? Okay, sure, no problem. Um, the general mission statement, which gives a very good overview of what we do at the counseling, it is to centralize coordination of all anti-drug activities relating to the prevention, 
rehabilitation and other incidental matters of victims for this misuse sorry and abuse of illicit drugs throughout the federation of st kitts and nevis according to the drugs act um, our functions generally in a nutshell there are about 18 or 19 listed but in a nutshell it is to encourage the in the establishment um, training awareness development of programs with regards to implementing programs or policies to help with prevention or intervention treatment and rehabilitation mm -hmm. we're also responsible for public awareness and education primarily among our youths um, we are responsible for international relations <laughs> there are a lot of treaties that we would have signed on to that makes us responsible to international organization in cooperation sharing best practices and the things of that that sort um, so that's pretty much it in a nutshell just think program development monitoring training international cooperation with mm -hmm. regard to the prevention treatment rehabilitation and care of individuals with regards to substances. So now I, I realize that you mentioned the youths, which is a target group, of course. What about the parents? Of course, as when you mention youths in school or whatever, you don't get results unless the parents are involved, involved. or the family, as the social support system is involved. So there are initiatives that we're trying to roll out as well that would incorporate parent parental awareness and education and as Mr. Nital gets on board he will yes. tell you of some of those plans as well. Okay good. Now, now Mr. Nital, you are drug prevention officer and if you can tell us what is your role as drug prevention officer? Drug prevention <coughs> officer role is to collect data, have interviews, go and make presentations. We, we have to understand one thing, that in every democratic society, there must be some element of dictatorship. Dictatorship because they have vulnerable sections in our society, of our population, when we speak about the young people. But they're not only the, the only vulnerable aspect of our society, you also have persons who, upon reaching the teen age, mm -hmm. they want to look buff, so yes. they get involved in gym activities, and they want to get results fast, so they get involved in the use of anabolic steroids, for example. They have to signal to the world that they would have arrived, mm -hmm. so they have to consume some alcohol and sometimes they are not guided properly with respect to that. We also have the other end of the spectrum where we have the adults who might be going outside of the very active, so to speak, life of gratification with the opposite sex. And they try to maintain what they might have lost <laughs> by natural the course of progression. And by doing that, they tend to risk their health. Because we know that it is no secret around here that persons get involved in sex enhancement, um, drugs. And we also look at that because it can be a problem. You can have heart problems, kidney problems, liver problems, all in a quest to do something that you were meant to do, but then time would have caught up with you. So we have to protect that vulnerable section of our society. Some of it is seen from what I am hearing, sort of rites of passage as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we have to get the message out there about how do we do it. As a society, we need to have a policy that is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Because we have situations where somebody 16 can have a baby. You cannot vote before you're 18. So there you see some disparity with respect to the challenges that you're trying to get everybody working in unison. I, I am of the strong opinion that drinking age, smoking age, should be up to about 21. Because this is when you have youngsters now coming to themselves and handling responsibilities. 
and the, the fathers, the parents no longer around. And I think that we are losing them too fast due to being misguided with respect yes. to the use of drugs. Mm -hmm. and we need to have a policy, a strong policy. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, I attended that marijuana commission the other day. Yes. And you heard persons complaining about the uprooting of about $17 million worth of marijuana plants by the RSS. And I asked uh, a pertinent question. Who was supposed to patronize that $17 million water supply? Where the monies were going to come from? So it's not, it's, it's not a fact that marijuana might not get anybody sick or cause a death, but we have to look at it as a precursor because when you look at the various um, permutations of probabilities mm -hmm. emanating from the base of marijuana, those are the things that we have to look at. Right. Where are they going to get the money to patronize $17 million worth of marijuana? So you speak to a policy. Mm -hmm. We need to have a policy, and we will discuss about the policy, but before we do that, can you tell us some of the activities of the Secretariat today? As he mentioned policies, I actually pulled up some information. Mm -hmm. Last year, we completed a national survey, the International Alcohol Control Study. Um, it was uh, funded by the International Development Research Center in Canada. Um, we had to write proposals and get the necessary funds to carry out um, this, this um, survey and this study. Um, so we were able to do research and findings and some of the policies, if I could just touch on that a little sure. bit, uh, from the proportion of respondents who support, it was focused on alcohol, and we wanted to see what the respondents, um, how they view certain policy, key policy areas with regards to alcohol. And what we found is that 75.4% were supporting the implementing of the blood or breath alcohol limit for drinking. Um, we had 66.3% of the respondents um, supporting the enforcement of existing legislation of an 18 as a purchase age. Mr. Nistal mentioned about increasing the age as okay. well and we had 58.8% of our respondents indicating that a pers the purchase age should be at least 20 years of age. So that is one of the projects that we have um, implemented in hopes of creating a national alcohol policy. Many times in our society we create policies without doing the background work. But we decided we need to see where the nationals are, what is encouraging persons to drink, where are they drinking, how much are they drinking, in order to help guide our policy decisions. And so that is one of the areas that we worked on. We previously worked on a secondary school drug prevalence survey as well. And we are hoping to do a, a new prevalence survey sometime soon. We have carried out a number of uh, education and awareness programs in the schools, uh, at the mental health facilities. We have conducted one of our bigger accomplishments. We trained uh, about 59 persons in the area of drug prevention and drug treatment. Um, so it's a lot of work. <laughs> I cannot recall all right now, but it's quite a bit of work that have been going on at the, the council secretariat um, for quite some time, but there's still a lot more work to be done. And so we hope to get a lot more going mm -hmm. as, as time progresses. Okay, Ms. Mr. Nittel mentioned something very interesting, and that was the uprooting of so many marijuana plants. And of course, we have here, you know, selling drugs and so on. Um, it is a business. And at the very same time, those who are involved in the business, I don't think that their main focus is on people getting sick or the detrimental effects of the drugs on people and so on. I know now they're labeling cigarette boxes and so on. Smoking kills and all this sort mm -hmm. of a thing. But on one hand, you have the sale of drugs or the provision of drugs being seen on, as a business. And on the other hand, there's a market for it. And you have people who somehow succumb to, you know, becoming addicted, abusing and misusing, which is really the downside. Yeah, it would be important to carry out a survey 
of the persons because we got to be frank and candid about it and we do a survey. All who using it really admit to using it. There is no locking up. There is nothing of that nature. And we get a good sense as to who using it and the age group. Because by doing that, and you look at the age group, you also have to look at whether or not those persons are gainfully employed. Because I'm convinced that you have a lot of persons who utilize the marijuana or the drug. They do not work. And if you do not work and you're trying to get the utility out of a good or service, then you have to find somewhere to get it. And this is where our crime rate would be impacted. Mm -hmm. Because then you steal whatever you have to steal in order to come up with a bat. You might not get money, but you might get a good that you can bat on. You steal somebody's television, you batter it for a quantity of jobs it would be important to establish the users, the age range, and also whether or not those persons are gainfully employed. And we have to do that because we just cannot, in isolation, do X, do Y. We must be in unison so we get a better understanding. Mm -hmm. One thing we have to redefine as well is, I don't even know if you can redefine someone's perception, but some people would say, I do not drink alcohol. I only drink wine and beer and Guinness. Well, my chemistry teaching would tell me that all of them would consist of OH group that defines the alcohol family. So regardless of what you call it, regardless of the percentage, it is still alcohol. And you might not get drunk off a glass of wine, but somebody else might get drunk mm -hmm. off a Guinness. Yes. So we need to let them know, regardless of what you consume, even though it is not called rum, because it seems as if unless it is called rum, people do not see it as alcohol. Mm -hmm. We have alcohol, the OH, functional group, as part of wine, we have it as part of beer, we have it as part of Guinness. Once you're consuming that, the eventual OH will reach your bloodstream. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned something very important, Mr. Nittel, is that it is your belief that most people who are involved in the use of drugs, um, and we know what we're talking about, alcohol and uh, marijuana and so on, that a number of these people do not work. And the question is, how do they get money to really buy the drugs or to get access to the drugs? And you're making an interesting link that drug prevention is somehow tied to crime reduction mm -hmm. Is that the link that you make? Most, most certainly. Because you have a rate of recidivism at the institution, HMP. And sometimes when you look at the guys when they are admitted to the institution, you can see that they're not in full control of their faculties. They were, their, their minds were derailed. And after a period of time, you see them shaking out of it. Of course, it came from drug use. And recidivism would not be so high if it wasn't for the consumption and the misuse and abuse of drugs. Because you have those persons out there, and of course there are adults. People would tell you they have the constitutional rights to consume what they want to consume. They have human rights, yes. as indicated by the European Convention on Human Rights. And, but one thing people would have to understand, that despite there being human rights, all of them are not absolute. There are only about eight of those human rights that are absolute. Mm -hmm. the, rest, the rest will be left up to the local government to tweak and tweak their based on the circumstances that prevail in your so, um, society those to bring about some degree of control. Those absolute ones are the, the inalienable ones, the God-given ones, of course. Um, some of them government can, but others were given to us by God, like the right to life. Mm -hmm. Right, of course. You know, and liberty, and so on, and the possession of property, and all of that, but, and freedom of speech, you know, although sometimes people try to shut you up, you know, you were about to say something. <laughs> yeah, and, and it is important for us to know that even though it is a right, the vulnerable must be protected. protected. Yes. And we put persons in authority, you don't have to carry out a referendum all the time to get 67% of vote. 
in order to decide what policy you'll put in place. It is your right as a person placed in authority to ensure that you protect the vulnerable. And the vulnerable would be persons who recidivate as a result of mm -hmm. misuse, abuse. Sure. Of so somebody would have to intervene. Mm -hmm. But how do you intervene? You need to establish programs inside of our institutions. People must not just go in and out. Because they go in and out without any sort of metamorphosis, any changes, yeah. they come back out to the same thing and they recidivate. Yes. And then we blame them. We can't blame them. We have to put systems in place, programs in place to have them assisted. Sure. We need to protect our school children because we go, we're talking about the criminalization of marijuana. Let us suppose you do that for even medicinal purposes. You go to the doctor, the doctor gives you medication. They say, look, take one every four hours. You took your first one at six o'clock in the morning. Then you drew one, 10 o'clock, and then two o'clock. Well, you're at school, if you're a school child. So then you go to the pipe and you take your water and you take your medication. Suppose we decriminalize and persons use it for medicinal value um, purposes. You go to school, you took your first puff or three puffs at six o'clock. You do puffs at ten. Then at two, where do you take your puffs? So you must have policies because you're taking it for medicinal value um, purposes. Then you must know say so well. The school must know get an area where people can go and take the puffs, since it is for medicinal value. Okay, so <laughs> okay. the medicinal mm -hmm. um, purpose of marijuana, I thought that it's for smoking as well. I, 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 I looked at smoking as more the recreational aspect of it, and the medicinal aspect of it would be in the form of some sort of a tablet or powder, or some sort of thing that you will get from the pharmacy. But why not, which, smoke, why not smoking? And which has to be prescribed. Yes, it will be prescribed, but it could be, you look at CNN, So the smoking is prescribed Gupta. as well. For, yes, for, so you see people taking pulse. For, 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 as, as an analgesic. Because you want to know how quickly do you want it to get into the system, get I into see. the brain and influence what it has to influence the receptors. So you are saying who is really going to monitor that? Yes, and you got to make provision for that at schools. Mm -hmm. You got to make provisions. Right. And if you're going to say, well, I need it for religious purposes, how come my five-year-old cannot use it, my eight-year-old cannot use it? But if you remember the Rastafari movement, then it is expected that whether you want two months, four months, that you have to use it. Mm -hmm. How would you say to a 12-year-old in first form that you cannot use it? But somebody who's a member of the Rastafari movement, the same 12 years, same first form, but they can use it. So there are a lot of things, questions, a basically. A lot of policies to put and in policies place. And policies to put in place before we can reach to that stage of, of decriminalization. Of course. And if we ever reach that stage. And as well, where there's the local marijuana commission that is in place as well. And I'm sure <laughs> those are a lot of areas that will be addressed as well. Um, so we look to see which direction the marijuana commission will be taking. It is always a very heated subject <laughs> when it comes up, the whole issue of marijuana. And that is because so many people in our society believe in the wonders of it. That, you know, I have to say wonders in inverted commas because they speak about it helps them with their meditation mm -hmm. and they believe it helps them with so many other things. But you never hear about what it doesn't really help them with. Um, you see, so. And that's another <laughs> thing I'd like to stress. Um, we can't deny that there are some benefits, but there are also a lot of dangers related to the use as well. So when we go out and speak about it, we have to give a balanced approach. Here are some of the benefits, but this is a long list of dangers or effects that could happen as a result of its use. So I'm, I'm, I'm like to push a more balanced approach towards the marijuana. Discussion. Yeah, and predisposition. If somebody's predisposed to be <coughs> bipolar disorder, and so utilize, right, utilization of the marijuana would trigger it off, then you have to take those into consideration as well. Yes. Because you might claim that it never ever did make anybody lose their mind. But at the same time, it might be something that would induce the symptoms. Yes, it may um, trigger it. Right, trigger it. And we have to be mindful 
you know, wholesome way, how do we balance it? It's a sort of delicate equilibrium to establish. Mm -hmm. How do we balance it? Th there was another study that, you know, I read something in a study that especially for young brains, mm -hmm. um, you know, a brain takes time to develop and so on. Up to 25, yes. Mm -hmm. Up to 25 and mm -hmm. so on. And using marijuana can severely affect brain development okay. in young people mm -hmm. and so that too I'm sure should be factored in to the whole thing in terms of um, decriminalization and access to this thing and so on because you don't want to have people walking around with half a brain or a quarter of a brain. But then the, there's evidence to the contrary. Uh, a Rasta guy who is 40 would indicate that he'd been using marijuana since he was two. Yes. And look what, what that the product that he is now. But then you see, when I in, in, in statistics, we refer to those things as um, outliers. Yes. Statistics are outliers, right. Because you have to look at the generalization, right. and the sample must be large enough mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. you to make a sort of a general deduction. And But of course, you have the exceptions. Most certainly. Yes. And we have to take everything on board. Mm -hmm. Every single thing on board. Mm -hmm. Something that I found interesting. The type of marijuana we have around here, it was indicated that there are four types. Jamaican, Vincent. St. Vincent, um, Tex Texas, 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 Miami, mm -hmm. and you have the local. Mm -hmm. So there are different gradations, is that it? Right. No, the problem is that was brought up, uh, highlighted when they had the commission was that because you have genetically modified marijuana, somebody has a claim to the hybrid that was effectuated. And uh, even though you might legalize it in your country, you might still have to face the intellectual property rights of the persons who have the authority of that genetically modified. Because you import it from wherever. How can you pass laws to govern what I have? I should have more say than you because that product really belongs to me. Really locally grown and I don't know who would have the genome for that. <laughs> but once you're importing it, they, are, they have um, organizations outside that are indicating that it is their property. So legalizing it locally might still have yeah. some depth yet to travel mm -hmm. before you can have the freedom to use the imported marijuana. Sure. Uh, okay, so we're speaking a lot about marijuana. Of course, as a favored drug, I can say, among young people locally in St. Kitts and Nevis, that is. And before you mention, Mr. Nittle, about institutions and the importance of institutions in drug prevention and treatment, you spoke about the prison. You have done a lot of work in the prison. You said that when sometimes you can see when um, people come into the prison, um, sometimes their mind is all messed up and so on because of the drugs. Now, what are some of the key institutions with which you network and collaborate, mm -hmm. uh, Miss Byron? With regards to, to the kill, with regards to prevention and treatment, some of the institutions that we partner with of course, is our group that we established the Drugs Prevention and Treatment Services, Inc., which comprises of the certified University of the West Indies certified drug treatment specialist and drug prevention specialist. Sometimes we get called at the council secretariat, um, whether it's managers calling to indicate that they have a, a staff sure. who is being inebriated on the job and may need help. And so often we will contact one of our specialists on board. We would refer to that individual to offer treatment services, which is talk therapy. There's also the community health nurses who offer assistance in that area. We have the mental health and substance abuse day treatment center where services are being provided. As a matter of fact, our DPATS group will begin facilitating sessions, the drug prevention slash intervention sessions with some of the clients there. Um, we work along with the counseling unit, which is located at Greenlands, as a form of referral services. Outside of intervention and prevention, we also collaborate with police. Um, as a matter of fact, we are in the process of developing our first 
national drug report in 2018 but it would be for 2017 so we have a number of key persons on board who are responding to our indicators that we would have been submitting and mr natal now yeah. is uh, supervising the drug collection um, process data, data mm -hmm. collection process and we have a technical advisor on board who often assists us in actually writing those reports so that is another project that we are working on and looking forward to bring out more statistics on what the impacts of substances in our federation really is sure. so there's a whole host of individuals who who collaborate with us institutions that we are connected to as the drug counselor as a whole as I said it's not only prevention and intervention but we look at supply um, related matters as well so the police customs the customs um, the police the men the hospital the hospitals are on the board as well the the CMO. The CMO. so it's a whole bunch of coordinated yes. mechanisms that are in place we're not a standalone institution mm -hmm. because it will not work that way mm -hmm. um, if we want to have the greatest impact we have to make sure that we're not reinventing the wheel when it's already there so we look around to see what is there what are we what we already have in our society mm -hmm. um in order to curb the challenges that we are facing now mr Nittel, in in your mind what do you think is the real importance or benefits of drug abuse prevention but we we life life is a will we have a societal will. Really. You come, you be productive, you contribute to the gross domestic product. The time would come when you would have to retire, resign, and enjoy what remains of your life. Somebody, while you are working, you are providing for somebody who are older than you. Right? Social security contributions. And they have the various forms of assisting people. Now the time has come for you to retire. Somebody would have to come behind mm -hmm. and ensure that you enjoy what left of your life. Mm -hmm. If we do not exercise these duties in trying to curb the misuse and abuse of drugs, we'll have a void. Mm -hmm. So you might end up without a pension. You might have to go and work um, security guard or when you're 74, 75 in order to get at least one meal per day. If you have that void as a result of lack of contribution to social security, then you can see what happened. Mm -hmm. we, we become like the US with a team, yes. always dropping a baton despite having a good team and never end up on the medal podium. Mm -hmm. And the medal podium is when you can get a monthly pension from your social security or wherever else it would come from. So we have to ensure that that societal will really continues. It cannot continue if you have persons with depraved minds, persons who cannot live a productive life. We have to have people contributing. It, it, it's a duty for us to contribute and live a productive life so our societal will really can continue. Anything short of that will leave a void mm -hmm. and it will put it will put what? It will put pressure on the government. Mm -hmm. You have to put safety nets in order to fill that void. And sometimes, even though you might have safety nets, the persons we are trying to help, they will not be in a position to appreciate the help because the, the faculties are not functioning as they ought to. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, it is necessary for us to intervene and make sure that that doesn't happen. Mitigate against that as much as possible. We might not be able to have it totally arrested but we can mitigate against it. Yes, things would happen, but that void mu must not be too wide that we cannot take a single step over. We must not have to run off and jump. We must take a small step over that void. In other words, we must try to prevent that gap being too wide. Right. Now, there is a drug abuse prevention policy that is in place at present. Am I correct? Um, it has expired, um, or national, but next year, February, something that we have been working on for a while, and we have collaborated with the Organization of American States through the Inter-American Drug Abuse Control Commission, and in February of next year, we will be hosting a regional workshop that will help us to develop that national drug policy. Okay, now, now 
So what would be some of the stages? It would it would have to, of course, you will have to to meet, of course, <laughs> and to decide all that needs to go into it, the professionals and and the stakeholders and so on, and then of course it would definitely have to go to the cabinet of course, for, approval. for approval, and then after approval it goes to the parliament mm -hmm. as, as a bill, mm -hmm. and then to be passed into law. Mm -hmm. So oh. yes, um, the work has already started, I can say that, because of course we want what are we seeing, and not just ad hoc information. And so the National Drug Information Network that we have launched just this February um, is a start in that direction. We have sound information, statistics in front of us to see what the real problem is. In January of next year, we hope to have a local workshop with key stakeholders and players in the society before we actually meet with those regional counterparts for that meeting in February. It's a lot of work. After we meet with those experts who will be guiding not only St. Kitts and Nevis, but other regional counterparts who too need to develop or update their mm -hmm. national drug policy or slash master plan, um, following that meeting, we then have a number of other local meetings with um, the general public, our local stakeholders, before we actually come with a solid document. Sure. So the process has started, <laughs> and then it will continue again next year. We have the blessing of some international donors who would assist in the interim, because you, you spoke about the, the process as you propagate from one step to the next step to the next step, and eventuality may be an act in terms of the policy. But in the interim, there's a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. And I joined that organization or the institution the 25th of September. And I've been reading and I've been examining as to where bottlenecks and challenges may be. And I think that unfortunately, one of the areas that would need better attention is mm -hmm. the budget. We need a budget that would facilitate the necessary work to take it to the propagation steps of going to parliament and being passed. Yes, okay. There's a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. okay. The budget, the current budget, would Cannot need... facilitate it. <laughs> no, no way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, now, over the years, you said that the Secretariat was founded in 2001. Correct. That's what you said. Um, has there been any sort of a study done in terms of how the Secretariat has made an impact over this time in accomplishing its missions, objectives, and goals? We would have, well, as a government agency, you always have to report what are your accomplishments, are you meeting your objectives each year, which is something that we do. But with regards to the social impact, we have not done an official study as yet, but of course, internally, we will try to assess, mm -hmm. uh, evaluate, and monitor some of the programs that we would have implemented. Um, for instance, not on a whole, but we have a number of our specialists who are creating drug prevention programs, whether it's in the school or another institution. And then now, between Mr. Nittal and I, we'll be the ones going out to evaluate and monitor are we really making any progress right. with regards to our goals. So this is a new step for us. So the, dr the drug abuse impact assessment has to be done. Yes. And out of that assessment, of course, you can really say, for example, how um, drug abuse is impacting the family. Correct. How it is impacting the economy. How it is impacting um, the place of work, mm -hmm. productivity and all of that is, yes? Correct, correct. Okay. Those are some areas that we and definitely want to push. Well. The, the learning, learning environment. environment. The academic school. Very, yes. very crucial. Mm -hmm. Those are mm -hmm. some areas that we are hoping to, to go into. Okay, so that is one of your... It's on the list. <laughs> 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 of the many things that we, we would like to accomplish. It's on the list. <laughs> okay. I know that you said that you're a psychologist. <laughs> Not and a psychologist. <laughs> not a psych. You, you did psych. Your area is psychology. You're not. You're not practicing. But Correct. I mean, right. <laughs> and and Mr. Nittal, you also he said that a you're a forensic psychologist. Psychologist. So I have two psychologists here. And of course, when it comes to drugs and drug abuse and so on, you always have that not only social component, but you have also the psychological component. So I would ask you, Miss Byron, um, what are some of the psychological causes of drug abuse? 
hmm, psychology causes of drug abuse. Um, I don't know if I, the, the word causes would be, but there are some reasons why people mm -hmm. begin using, a number of various reasons why people begin using. And of course, there's a progression up to misuse mm -hmm. and abuse and addiction and dependency. Some is just to experiment or at a young age, you see their peers getting involved. Some for coping. Um, escape. A, escape. A means of escape, escape coping, reality. trying to deal with mm -hmm. their problems. Self-medicating because of medical or physical challenges and of course you don't automatically begin to use a substance and you're dependent it's different for certain persons but there's a progression to it so you begin maybe because of exposure experimenting and then you move up the ladder and then maybe you use it as a social tool to help you socialize better with others and then maybe to feel that you're in genetics, control correct mm -hmm. because of right. genetics and other factors it, it gradually goes up to misuse abuse yes addiction then dependency it, it is a sort of a paradox because it is sold out there that drugs put you in control <laughs> that you drink the alcohol and you're more in control but really and truly you're less in control but of course I suppose sometimes when people take drugs then you see them behaving in particular ways and they will tell you certain things that they could not tell you if they were not under the influence of the drug. Dutch courage. Dutch, they call it Dutch, Dutch courage. courage and that is why sometimes people say, you know, Tom drunk but Tom ain't fool. <laughs> Tom knows exactly what he's <laughs> saying. It is something that he wants to tell you all along <laughs> but couldn't find the courage to tell you. Mm -hmm. And it is somewhere there when he drinks, now He's um, uninhibited, mm -hmm. you know, so he speaks freely. Mm -hmm. Tongue get loose. Oh dear. <coughs> <laughs> become delusional. Become Hold delusional. to fixed false perceptions, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even in light of a preponderance <laughs> of evidence to the contrary. They hold on to that. Mm -hmm. And they hallucinate those um, sensory perceptions in the absence of stimulus. You, you, you're pulling in the fish, you don't have any net, you don't have any sea water, you don't have any fish, and you hallucinate, you know, delusionary, and you experience the hallucinations, all those are impacts. But over a period of time, the usage will have to increase, because when you used to take X amount to achieve that level of height, so to speak, or relaxation, then you'll take much more than that. And as it multiplies, Dependency. right, then the economics now, you have to spend more mm -hmm. to achieve the same heights that you used to achieve. With and what if you don't have the salary for it? Right. Mm -hmm. Or the income for it? You, what happens then? Mm -hmm. you, you, you become indebted to persons because you might have taken something from on higher purchase. And instead of making your monthly payment, you took that payment and you go and you you um, satisfy your increased mm -hmm. drive for this thing and then you end up in debtor's court and your whole life becomes chaotic so there are ramifications mm -hmm. it is just not using it and feeling relaxed something the, the, the relaxed feeling is could be the, the, the deceptive but you have you have institutions, you have firms where they encourage the persons, the workers, employees to utilize marijuana because you might be handling very fragile um, stuff, objects, and the need for you to slow down, take your time and do what you're doing. There are other times when you take it and it might be inappropriate for what you're involved in because you might have to sprint down the end. You might be a defender and you have to sprint to catch an, an attacker, prevent him from an assault and mm -hmm. your goal. And you're moving basically in slow motion. So there are times when it is appropriate the use. Mm -hmm. Like slow you down when you're handling fragile stuff and then the next time when it's just so inappropriate. Is it timing? That is what intervention is all about, timing. Yes. You, you know sometimes as we speak here about those tangible drugs like alcohol, mm -hmm. marijuana, tobacco, cocaine, 
whatever the case is. Mm -hmm. There are other things that provide a sort of a drug effect. For example, sex, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, gambling, mm -hmm. and which can be as detrimental in terms of the, the economic downside to it. I mean, I'm, I'm gambling now, so, you know, I take all my money and I go and I gamble, and then my family is left wanting, or I am craving for sex so much that I become so um, promiscuous and so mm -hmm. on that I endanger my, I, I, I put myself in danger mm -hmm. um, at risk for certain things and so on. You know, so some things are not really the, the drugs that we are talking about here, but they have the same effect. And some of them is when you get broke, you look at alternatives, and you'll be surprised that in your home, items that you use, liquid that you use in your home, mm -hmm. can be used to give you the same sort of sensation of feeling you, <laughs> I don't wish to, yes. call, call, to call them, but mm -hmm. there's stuff inside of the home that people would use. Like probably mouthwash. <laughs> <laughs> your Listerine, you start drinking that. Contact, oh, yeah. contact cement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a whole range That's of nice. them that I don't wish to make anybody wiser. And, sure. And then we're speaking a lot about how persons <laughs> turn, to, turn to these substances to cope or to deal with challenges. But there are much healthier options out there for you to deal with whatever stressors that you're dealing with, whatever um, emotional problem. There are healthier options and they are more rewarding. I mean, when you take the substances, temporary relief, but if there are a number of persons offering counseling, therapy, techniques to help you deal with your stressors or whatever you're dealing with. And so we often encourage person to use that healthier option instead of substances. And I just thought it was important to know that here because we spoke about how persons turn to these for coping mechanisms. Yes, but have you ever seen it as part and parcel of the culture in which we live? We live in a culture really where people want a quick fix. People like things to be instantaneous. Mm -hmm. um, why must I, you know, work over long term to achieve something when I can just achieve it by a quick fix? And, so, and it's precisely what you spoke about, that the drugs basically give a quick fix. Something and that temporary. is temporary. <laughs> um, and then when it wears off, I have to get another quick fix. And then the challenges progress. <laughs> and then the challenges progress. So there are challenges, but what is the secretariat um, doing? I know this program and so on, to really bring awareness to all of these challenges. You're involved in school programs. You go to the primary schools and you have discussions. You try to bring the language down to the age group and get them to understand the impact that alcohol or the misuse or even the very simple usage of it can can have on your body. You ramification as a result of being intoxicated. You can't show up to the work. You show up to the work, you might put your, 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 your life at risk because you have to operate this, you have to operate that. And you promote debates, mm -hmm. pros and cons. You attend parents teachers meeting and you make presentations. You appeal to the good judgment. You ask them to do, do not make any um, non-judicious decisions. You got to be informed, mm -hmm. you know. And to be informed, you must be educated as to the physiological impact drugs will have on you, and the economics, the social, and uh, where it can lead to antisocial behavior, and then antisocial behavior could be upgraded to criminal activities. Right. Okay. And in so. addition to what Mr. Nittal just mentioned as well, um, through our DPATS group, we have um, a lot of the members are either guidance counselors, nursing, and so we have equipped these individuals to utilize those skills, those knowledge within the institution that they work in. Mm -hmm. So right now we're focusing on the ministry, well, in the education setting during the teachers training just before they re-enter into the school all the guidance counselors met and one of the key focus for that meeting um, between Dr. Esdale the chief yes. education officer and myself we train 
all the guidance counselors on developing drug prevention programs within the school. And so the drug council is working very closely with the Ministry of Education to, show that, to ensure that these prevention programs are established, implemented, and working within the schools. And not only there, we want to evaluate and monitor and see how we can improve those programs mm -hmm. as well. Sure. So that is one of the areas we are currently looking at. Outside of the, the school setting as well, we have worked with the New Horizon Rehabilitation Center. Mm -hmm. um, we have already worked with them to develop a drug prevention slash intervention slash treatment um, sure. service there. And from the last follow-up, they hope to implement that um, next year. So those are some mechanisms that we are using in order to reach and educate some persons in addition to what Mr. Nital um, just spoke of. And, and to add to that, sometime therapy, talk, um, Ms. Byron spoke about talk therapy, which is ideal for a lot of situations because it's not always medication. Medication could have side effects. Sure. And sometimes even when you give somebody medication to correct a mental issue, you it would induce side effects. And then you have to give them more medication to cancel out the side effects. No. You know, talk can have side effects too, you know. Yes. The side effects of course you have to talk to people who are professional. You have to speak to people with a certain level of or a very high level, not a certain level, of confidentiality. Mm -hmm. and so on because the side effects might be you go and tell somebody your problems and you go and tell somebody your business mm -hmm. and next thing somebody sending you a whatsapp with your business or you hear it trust on the street. Trust and confidence. So the trust mm -hmm. and confidence mm -hmm. must be there. Mm -hmm. And you hear it so clearly in our culture. Some people don't want to go and talk to the guidance counselor because they would hear the business on the road because your best friend, you might not be your best friend's best friend, mm -hmm. right? And uh, what happened to because of pride there's a disconnect families tend to disown and go away from an individual once they are associated or perceived to be involved in drugs and they would have belittled the family so they dissociate and one thing we want to emphasize is that apart from counselors and everybody trying to make an input via talk therapy Nothing is more important than family embracing mm -hmm. an individual that would have mm -hmm. reached that stage. Yes. Family embracing is very, very, very important. So the family support is... Yes, is very, very important because some people, they have so much pride that they cannot stand to believe that this is a Powell here, this is a Byron here, no, we're disassociating. And that is where the problem would come in, that disassociation could lead to the person taking a longer period of time to recover. And even if they start to recover, they go and they experience relapse because they're not getting the support. Yes. And, and, and I suppose that that is what we spoke about before in terms of the importance of the psychology. Um, if people don't feel loved, mm -hmm. if people don't feel wanted, needed, mm -hmm. supported, if they don't have that sort of network and so on, then this can basically drive them into this quick fix of feeling good, mm -hmm. this feel, this kind of feel good thing and that can be the beginning of um, drug use mm -hmm. which can lead to basically drug abuse because there are deeper issues, mm -hmm. deeper things that are not being, um, you know, met, right. needs that are not being actually met. Um, that is why the family is so, so important, Brilliant. or support from a some support su a support system mm -hmm. from some institution. Um, but culturally, sorry, culturally we frown down on addicts. We have a lot of addicts, work, um, reasonable amount of addicts around. walking around, and we frown down on them. We try to avoid them, we move, we run, we talk about them in negative ways, but they need help. And we are not making, putting out a concerted effort to help these addicts. We have to. And something that I would like to our federation to establish is a rehab center where these addicts can go and get that treatment. Most of the time you have to travel overseas and travel in expenses and staying out there. Yes. We have the capacity in terms of human resource. We just need a facility and the proper supporting assets that we can establish uh, an effective rehabilitation center. Okay. Now, I, I know that recently there was the 
um, building, of course, of the an opening of the uh, mental health the treatment facility, which is an initiative, of course, of the Ministry of Health. How closely do you work along with the Ministry of Health? Okay, um, the Drug Council, we have been involved with the mental health and substance abuse, the treatment center, even before it opened its doors. Mm -hmm. um, we have worked along with Dr. Halliday, sorry, not Dr. Halliday, Dr. Archibald, mm -hmm. and uh, um, the CMO where we had pre-meetings. And so our contribution back to that facility is having our drug prevention and treatment services. We have developed a full program with a manual that we will be going into the facility to offer prevention intervention services. Mm -hmm. This will be a 14 weeks, running two days a week um, program, and also involves family involvement because one of the, based on our initial assessments, um, one of the things that we discovered through the community nurses who work along with these patients is that the family do not seem to understand the depth of the problem, the mental health and substance abuse problem. So we're not only looking at the prevention intervention with the clients who are at the center, but also their family or a support system that they can rely on. We have at least two to four sessions with those individuals. At the end of that training, we hope to give those individuals a certificate of completion so that when they look on the wall yes. and they see the certificate... <laughs> there's an there's achievement. Right, there's a sense, sense of an of achievement and a reminder that, hey, I know better. I've gone through this process and it's a sense of encouragement to help them um, on their journey to a better life without substances. Right. Now we have to go to the phone lines. This program is a call-in program, at least part of it, and we want to hear what the people have to say. I'm sure there are people who have a lot <laughs> that they want to say or to ask questions or to or to give comments. So we are going to put on our headphones and um, open the phone lines. The phone lines are now open and the numbers to call are 465-2555. That is the local number. 465-2555. And the overseas number is 1718-577-2916. That is 1718-577-2916. We welcome your calls. Now, in terms of, um, you mentioned before about the the Drug Prevention and Treatment Services Incorporated and the St. Kiss Navy's Drug Information Network. Could you tell, you, you spoke about the Drug Prevention and Treatment Services Incorporated. What about the Drug Information Network? Okay. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, no problem. The St. Kiss Navy's um, National Drug Information Network was launched in February of this year. Um, it's an initiative in order to collect information so as to guide policies and programs. We have a number of key respondents that we work with, including the police, customs, um, Ministry of Health, prison, um, Hospital. hospitals, mental health, substance abuse center as well, where we try to get a total assessment of what is going on in the Federation mm -hmm. with regards mm -hmm. to substances. Um, and, and sometimes it can be challenging trying to collect data in seeing it's it's not a common practice mm -hmm. <laughs> for us. But if we want to get more directed policies and directed programs, it is very important to make sure you have that hard um, statistical information to back up the direction of your services. So that was launched in February and we hope by um, next year of 2018, our mm -hmm. technical advisor who is responsible for creating the report will have a quality standard report that we can reference. Uh, if someone asks us how many persons were incarcerated as a result of substance yes. abuse or <coughs> how many persons went to the psychiatric um, unit as a result of um, marijuana um, abuse and addiction with mental health illnesses, we could provide that information and from the information as well create more directed policies mm -hmm. to help curtail the challenges that we are facing. Why, why do you think, Mr. Nital, 
there are so many challenges in terms of collecting data, especially on, on, on in things like these. Like, <laughs> like Mr. Byron indicated, it's just our culture. I don't know. We once had, we once had a survey to establish where the sink is nevis is a source or a sink of carbon dioxide emission. And there's a call on the line. Working for you, good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. Good Mr. afternoon. Williams. Good afternoon, sir. And Gordon Nital, how Cult are you doing? Culture, good afternoon. I'm all right. How are you doing? Well, I hear as usual, keeping my hands busy, you know. <laughs> I'm working on a, on, on a tour of you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and good afternoon to the, to the young lady there. She sounds very brilliant. Miss oh. Miss Byron. Car oh, yeah, Carrie Byron. That lady Byron. Oh. Yes. Good afternoon. Thank you. Yes. Now, I have a little comment on this thing, what we call it, drugs. Now, just like how you see the law enforcement, they try to hunt down the marijuana plant. That is not a drug. It is a plant. They have other trees that can really give people the high that marijuana give people. There is a plant that called dry juice. That there is more powerful than the marijuana. Just ten seeds, ten dry seeds of those of that plant. You boil them and just drink it in five seconds. You see what I mean? Five minutes. You see what you do with your brains. But anyway, why don't they ban the uh, what you call the importers or the manufacturers from making these drugs because? Every drug people take for medical use, they have side effect. What do not have a side effect on it all? He might have on Mr. Williams or Ms. Byron, and he, 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 he may not have any, any on me. Now there is a new drug coming out of China called synthetic. And as, according to what they said, it is deadly. One haul or one, one spoonful or whatever it is, you're gone. It's not getting steel booze and wake up and go back and take another pull. So what I say, kill the root of it, then there would not be any buyers. Just like they're trying to kill the marijuana root that nobody could have it to buy or sell or do whatever it is. Kill the, the drugs, stop, import them, ban them. Let us go back to old, old, um, old, time, old time days like how they used to. Long ago, I mean, knowledge increased, yes, but we got to be careful with what they order for us to take as medicinal drugs. Otherwise, if you provide a market, you will have buyers. Thank you all very much for listening. Okay. Yes. Could I say like something true. with respect to that? We, we would have to be careful because there, there are certain drugs that we must use. For example, we hear about cocaine, but cocaine comes from the family of allocaine, proper cane, benzocaine. Cocaine is the strongest of them all. Mm -hmm. And we use them, dentists would use them, doctors would use them. The family, it is known for that. Now, we also have to be mindful that we are into tourism. Yes. And in recent times, we've been speaking about seven ships and five ships coming in. With that volume of persons coming in, there's always a probability, very strong probability, that persons can bring things that would be new to our locality. Yes. And as a result of that, would get into our local domain and the use of it would be propagated. So we have to be mindful that we tourism, because I'm confident that a lot of maybe the venereal diseases that we encounter here, they did not start in St. Kitts Nevis. Somebody brought them in. And when you are involved in tourism and you are thriving with respect to the volume of persons <coughs> coming, there's always increased probability of things slipping through the chute and reaching into local domains. It can be very difficult sometimes. Yes. And with Donald Trump mood of having people deported, mm -hmm. persons would bring their habits. They might also seek to import things that they used to use out there. And our borders are a bit porous, so it is possible that things can come in. And that is where we get the new drugs being introduced into our um, federation. I know the one that culture spoke about a while ago. Mm -hmm. When you use it, you're gone. You run into a vehicle, you mash up wing screen, you're just gone. I mean, how can we stop it from coming? 
the very delicate equilibrium when you have persons coming, you don't want to harass them, you want them to feel free to enjoy our hospitality. But at the same time, there's always the probability of something coming. Well, there are some <laughs> persons, Nita, let's face it, who feel like part of providing the hospitality is to be providing the drugs to the tourists who come in. I have seen that on the on the beach. I see the guys come there all the time and you know, of course, they, they, it's, it's a market. It's a market for them to provide a little marijuana, a little spliff, and, and uh, the tourists, you know, some of them take quite delight in it. But it, it, we are concerned about the new ones coming. Yes. We are quite aware of what we have here. But then, when you're not aware of what was brought in, you might not be made aware of it until it would have had yes. a very adverse impact on yes. the lives of some of our individuals. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And I am also told it's the sort of a, I've heard of things like Spranger, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and people say, well, you know, don't let anybody roll your spliff for you. Right. You must roll your spliff yourself because they can really mess you up, like whatever they put into it, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's coke or some other thing into it that can really send you funny. And some people voluntarily would use it. Because what they were using before is not strong enough. Yes. And they want to get a high, higher than Mount Misery, higher than Mount Everest. And they cannot get it from just using the pure marijuana. So they have introduced into it, integrated into it, other material that would give them a, so to speak, quote unquote, better high. Mm -hmm. Until you fall, there's no cushion under there. I know the joy juice that the gentleman is, um, spoke about. Mm -hmm. It would cause you to go on building very, very high and feel like you have, you have wings to fly. Only when you would have fallen and broken up your bones, you realize that mm -hmm. the, the illusion that you went through was detrimental to you. you I, I know that sometimes the campaign against drug abuse <laughs> prevention tends to be very generic at times. You see over the place, say no to drugs. But then I will ask a question after that. Why must I say no to drugs? Mm -hmm. So maybe instead of just putting up say no to drugs, our signs need to be a little bit more graphic mm -hmm. in terms of saying what drug does. The negative impact of drugs on human behavior and on the society as a whole. Because say not to drugs, that's very general, that's very... And it's even recommended on the international fronts that saying not to drugs is <laughs> not working. <laughs> so you have to find more creative means to, to spread that message. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an area that we really need to, to zone in on as well. Graphic arts, um, even pushing it f further than just a sign. Uh, persons are into music and entertainment so having our musicians come on board to assist with a positive message regarding the um, not yes. using substances and alcohol those are other creative means in order to push the message but of course as, as Mr. Nittel rightfully pointed out earlier these things they cost money they co it's a cost associated with them but you're definitely right we need to go further than just say no to drugs when I look at the at Borea, where we have the research going on. The biomedical. Right. I think that we're looking at the negative of the marijuana, but if we can get into research, we need to encourage a lot of school children to gravitate more towards the sciences, research science. And we can, we can make a fortune from doing research. That is an aspect that we have to look at. It's just not the smoking. We have a call. We, we have a call. Working for you, good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon, Mr. Lesroy. Good afternoon, Nital. Boy, I hear your voice for quite a while, and to the young lady here. Good, good afternoon, afternoon, sir. Yeah, I, I just want to add something here to the program there. Um, marijuana. I had a friend, female, who used to suffer a lot from migraine. And I'm one of those bush people, and I believe it, uh, I'll try the medicine. So I said, why don't you use some ginger? Well, she have tried it, tried it. Until one day, the, the conversation came up again, and then, so I said, well, I said, so I said, you still complain about migraine? She said, no, I don't complain. And I said, well, what the problem is? She said, she used to drink marijuana tea. And since she started drinking marijuana tea, the 
the the pain of migraine completely disappear. There's another uh, uh, individual that I know uh, in Canada who who does work with with uh, uh, mid older older people, uh, people who retire and so forth. And she had to do a lot of standing up until finally she came down with sole legs and so forth, was off work for months. Then there was even talks about uh, operation. And she was, somebody suggested to her, why don't she take marijuana oil? And I spoke to her about four days ago, and she said to me, she said, boy, so you won't believe in her. So I always asked her about what is happening to her, how is that thing going with it, with it foot and so on. And she said, now she's, she's now taking marijuana oil. She put about three drops under her tongue about twice a day. And she said, thank God, I no longer suffer from the problem, the, the aching feet and all that. So I believe that there most more research should go into this marijuana because it seems to me there's something good about it. But for some reason, if they know, they're hiding all the information from, from people who are suffering terribly. And if this thing can help people, I don't see why they can't free it up. When I say free it up, I think you know what I mean, Nital. But no, something is, something is wrong here. Okay, thank you very much, man. Okay, thank you. You want to comment on <laughs> yeah, Yes, he is, he is correct. But there will always be a war. You have those who believe in medication from the normal doctors and those who believe in using the weed to bring about improvement. There is no denial that it helps. It really helps. But then that is where we can go into the research. We do the separation. That for recreational use, the various chemicals you have now for the medicinal um, properties and usage. And once we can get that, we establish a lot. I mean, we don't even have to go and reinvent the wheel. You see Dr. Gupta on CNN mm -hmm. talking about this on a regular basis. You get up 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, he, he's doing the program and he has evidence that it, it is working. But how do we, it has in about 400 and something different chemicals. How do we separate and we have that for the recreational, that for the medicinal, and then we make good of it. And then we can have those things in the pharmacy now with dosage. Because when I, I'm convinced a lot of persons do not know what they're smoking. Once I got the potency was X, now it is 20X. So you have to be aware of how much you're taking. And once you can do that, I think we can head places. Working for you. Good afternoon. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Hello. Let me just add something here, Nichal. Sure. I remember some time ago, Mister Doctor Asigai. I can remember when I heard him so many years ago. That man saw if he was dying, and then he came back on really bright and vibrant and so forth. And he said that one of the twenty things that he be he be using that brought him back to health was marijuana and. Um, uh, this this thing here that, that we have here, man, uh, that smell really bad. Bad, what do you call it? Noni. Noni. And no, he said is marijuana and noni. He didn't say how he used it, but he said, and trust me, the man voice sounds as if he is just risen from some. Well, I don't want to say what, but he sound really bright and healthy. And healthy. Thank you. Yeah, correct. He gave the information. He called. I was on the program, and he called, and he did indicate that the marijuana really helped him out. And as I said earlier, we can't deny that there are benefits, but we cannot ignore the fact that there are a lot of harmful effects associated with it as well. So we have to make sure that we dot all our I's and cross all of our T's before we make a decision on the direction that we would like to take with regards to marijuana and think it's an Because it is, yeah. it is our inexperienced youngsters who are abusing and misusing the marijuana. The experienced guys know exactly how to do what they have to do. The youngsters are involving and they're choking themselves. They don't know how to swallow the smoke. They don't know how to get it back to them. No, they're just misusing <laughs> and abusing. No, serious. But in they, time, they, they will learn. Yeah, but they're suffering in the <laughs> interim. And that is what we're concerned about. Because remember still, the, the brain would not be fully developed before the age of 25. So we still need to keep them under control and do what we have to do to offer them treatment. Yes. You, there's another concern, of course, is that when I look at the police report, in terms of arrests, 
charging, convictions and so on, so much of it is really for the possession of cannabis, the possession of cannabis with intent to supply and importation of, importation of cannabis and so on. So much of it is tied up with cannabis that it seems to me that our, our criminal system, you know, a lot of it time. can be cause called cannabis <laughs> in, a, in a certain sense um, and there's a lot of time and energy and so on being taken up in the court mm -hmm. and so on I'm not saying that you know people should not be held accountable and so on but it's really time consuming. I, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. Yes, not only that, because you get a conviction. And as a result of that conviction, you, you get a criminal record. And you, cannot, you do not have the latitude to do things that you would like to do because of a criminal record. And I think that it is time on a wholesome basis we consider expunging some of those records for persons who might have been convicted as a result of using marijuana. Because then they can't get a job, they can't travel overseas, a lot of restrictions. And that in and itself that could put other problems. Fresh, yeah, other problems. And, and I think it's time that... That will get them to use more of it. <laughs> right. And we, 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 have to be, we, we have to be mindful that we have to work on, on it for... We got to work in unison. Yes, you did that. You decriminalize for us. You try out that. And you see where you go from there. But decriminalizing would come with certain conditions. You have to put down those conditions. You got to calculate them properly to decriminalize. Mm -hmm. I think the eventuality might be to legalize, but to what extent? Mm -hmm. and that's could, you, could you, could you, uh, Mr. Nital, differentiate for the public? Because I think people do not know. What is the difference between decriminalization and legalization? Okay, let us put it this There's way. There's a technical um, difference. Let us suppose you, you get a traffic, a ticket. Someone is on yes. the line. Working for you, good afternoon. Working for you, Les Y. How oh, are you? I am well jammed out. Nice to hear your voice back in the land of the living. <laughs> Thank you so God much. God bless thinking. Thank you. And I must say a warm welcome to Mr. Nital. <laughs> and that young lady, she's sounding very good. She put me in the mind of a poly Manchester, long time on the radio. <laughs> um, um, that's why yes, the, sir. The, 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 the discussion today is very, very timely. And I, I love this kind of discussion, especially when man like Nital around. Mm -hmm. Somebody who understands, get a business. Mm -hmm. You understand? What I like to see with this thing, this committee, they're coming in the various communities and sell this thing. Not like our gangster do us with this free movement thing and causing us real problem and educate the people. We must educate the people going forward about this thing. Not just get up and do this thing. We have to give the education. That's why you see where that free movement is bringing to us. Yes. We're getting it real hard because we youngsters, them don't understand th that these people who come into our shows got, got privilege just like us. Right. A gangster just get up and sign, looking political mileage, and it causing we problem. But we welcome them and are urging all of them to do the right thing. When they come here, go and get a work permit and support the social security. I heard Mr. Little talking about social security and I want him to, to, to expand on it some more. Ladies, youngsters know they got to support social security because we, we ain't going to give them nothing out of that when, when they get hurt, you know, uh, when they, 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 they get crazy because a lot of them using this stuff and, and eating and taking vitamins like it's so be. See? When you look at the, the, the old factory chimney, all you could have seen is just coals coming out of it. And they got to understand these things. At a certain time, is a cut off point with this thing, with this body where God gave us. Yes. Nital, I want to hear your voice a little more in radio. <laughs> Don't run from us. Don't trust them. Yes. We must hear your voice. 
Your, your wishes, my command. I warning you, we want to hear your voice some more. Yes, sir. And that's why yes, I think you, you, you're missing. And, and that young lady there, I don't know her, but that boy, she could talk. I love to hear talk. Right. We want to hear young right. women like them right. and this political stage as well. Uh -huh. You understand? Yeah. We need sure. young women in this thing. Sure, we, jam down. We need young women in this thing. Anyway, oh, okay. it's a good program. I love it and continue. Thank you so Thank you. much. You take care. Okay. That was jam down, more <laughs> offering words of commendation than... <laughs> than anything else but before he called we were making a distinction between the between the criminalization and legalization the criminalization oh, you could um let's suppose you're driving you get a ticket you would not be sent to prison for it because it is not so to speak a crime mm -hmm. you'd have committed an illegal act or an act that would cause you to get a penalty, so to speak. You go and pay something. You, you go and pay something like that. And it's if you don't pay, it de can then become... If you uh, don't pay, then you can be then charged, isn't that so? Yeah, just like debtor's court. Right. It's not really a crime, but you, you go on because you disrespect an order of the court, so to speak. Okay. And the illegality of something is that you just should not be using it at all. Mm -hmm. You can end up being incarcerated. You can fine and confine because it is illegal. You ought not to be using it. You understand? Right. Whereas the criminalization, they might put stipulation as to what you can do, how much of it, blah, blah. but but illegality means you just cannot use it at all. Okay, and legalization means it's a free to you, use. You, you, yes, you can use it. You can use Just it. Just like a cigarette is legal. Right. You can smoke And you can it, use any amount of any it. Any amount of it. There's no restriction being right. put on it. But with decriminalization, they got to come with conditions. They have if, to qualify it, the okay. conditions under which you would use it and where you might use it and where you cannot use it and quantity and that, that sort of stuff. Okay. I, I notice now, for example, in some places... Um, I was just in the UK and they, they banned smoking, of course, in indoors, in public places and so on. But Lord, when you're outside, the whole place smells of smoke. <laughs> so it, it has moved from the indoors really to the outdoors. It has become a big um, chimney kind of a thing, mm -hmm. an outdoor chimney. And you're still inhaling the smoke and so on and so on and so on. But... But our heads of government at the last CARICOM meeting, I think they, they address that. Mm -hmm. they, they're trying to make up their minds whether or not they should have restrictions placed on persons who want to smoke whatever they want to smoke in a um, public domain. Mm -hmm. I think it is unfortunate. If I'm not a smoker, you should not cause that um, smoke to diffuse through my nostrils that I was running from. That is correct. It is unfair. Yeah. So with the criminalization, they got to put some parameters mm -hmm. to it and where you should use it and where you should not. Right, right. Okay, now, there's a question I wanted to ask you, Ms. Byron. Um, does the Secretariat provide counseling services? Okay, um, the, the council secretariat is not a counseling center. What we can offer, as I stated earlier, our functions are mainly to train um, develop programs, policies, workshops, you know, things along that line. So at the facility itself, we do not offer counseling. Even though Mr. Nitana and I have the background, <laughs> sometimes mm -hmm. we may have a one or two persons and we'll have like a crisis intervention sure. if need be. But we generally refer um, persons who need care to other facilities, such as a counseling unit, to the hospital, to community centers, or to one of our certified drug um, treatment specialists for service. So no, we do not it's not in our purview to offer counseling. Okay. You make referrals. Secretariat. We make referrals. Okay. Well, I think we're out of time. It is, time goes by quickly. Doesn't wait on any man or woman. And I would ask if there's anything that you would like to say in wrapping up. Well, it, it is a learning curve. It's the council with respect to its practical activities might be in its embryonic stage, 
but it is an integral part of our society to ensure that we have a policy with respect to drugs. Mm -hmm. Without a policy, you're headed nowhere because how can you have a reference point mm -hmm. to indicate whether or not persons are complying? Should the emphasis be on penalizing people or going for compliance? And I think with respect to drug usage, there should be a hybrid because we cannot let people get away for the misuse and abuse because those who administer in any way, shape or form must be held accountable. So there must be some penalties, but at the same time we prefer compliance and that mm -hmm. people would keep the usage of drugs in an area or to a volume that it would not lead to societal issues thereafter, mm -hmm. depending on the usage. Sure. And I just want to mm -hmm. wrap up and say thank you so much for having us here today. Um, we appreciate being able to share with the general public what the National Council on Drug Abuse Prevention is all about. We also would like to encourage social responsibility mm -hmm. because the government can only do so much, mm -hmm. but we have a lot of persons in society who can offer assistance as well to our council and to some of our programs that we would like to be. So we welcome social responsibility and social involvement. Persons may also be wondering, I'm trying to wrap up quickly, persons <laughs> may also wonder how they can contact us um, if they have questions or recommendations we are open to that and our contact information by phone is 467-1703 467-1703 or 662-3839 we can also be reached via email at sknnacdap at gmail.com and we can also be found on Facebook as well where we try to keep mm -hmm. persons abreast of what we are doing at the council. Thank our, you once and again. And our offices are located at third okay. floor of the church okay. building. Okay, right. Well, thank you so much for being on today's program. Uh, Mr. Nital, who is Drug Prevention Officer, he's new on board and he's working along with the director of the St. Kitts and Nevis National Council for Drug Prevention Secretariat. Like both of you, I look forward to a national drug policy. Um, of course, all the stages that you would have to go through, I hope that those would be expedited, that you would collect enough information, um, data, and the collaboration would be there to make that actually happen. I want to thank all of the callers to today's program. Those of you who continue to support this program from week to week, we thank you very much. Wherever you are, whether you're here in St. Kitts, and I know there are many people um, that are listening abroad. I have been your host, Les Roy Williams, and we will see you next week for another Working For You. Have a pleasant day. <laughs> Working for you. A weekly talk radio program which highlights developments of national interest and the activities of your St. Kitts Davis government. Join host Les Roy Williams as he presents news, views, reports, and interviews about everything regarding the activities of the Team Unity government and the building of our communities and the development of St. Kitts Davis. Tune in and call in to interact with your government and share your views regarding the upward forward development of your community and our beautiful Twin Island Federation. Working for you is weekly, every Wednesday live from 1.30 p.m. to 3 p.m. on ZIZ Radio, Win FM, and Sugar City FM with rebroadcast on participating stations. Working for you. Stay up to date with news, programs, and activities of the government with SKNIS. Like us on Facebook. Listen to us on SoundCloud. Follow us on Twitter. And watch our videos on YouTube. Connect with us today. SKNIS, St. Kitts and Nevis Information Service.